this region has been for different conditions always been very hot and uh, different reasons going to their reasons of climate there is its geography uh, there isn't enough precipitation in this region so it has been hot for a while even if you consider the last 200 years ago this region was hot didn't have much agricultural activity until there were canals over here uh, but recently what we're seeing in the last uh, 10 to 15 years we're seeing that the heat has uh, already exceeded uh, increased by 1.5 to 2 degrees in this region. Uh, there is a period where heat and humidity strike at the same point. So you have heat already is very, very deadly for different uh, aspects of all it needs to be hydration and uh, overall creates circumstances where you necessarily have to take a break. But when it coincides with uh, humidity, and this is where we start measuring the heat index or what your uh, regular weather apps mention as the real field, uh, it becomes much worse. So what we see from Jacobabad to Karachi is that it's not only hot, but it's hot and humid, particularly from June onwards when it coincides, when the heat coincides uh, with your uh, humidity. So not only we have a heat wave uh, period from April to May, but now we have a period where it coincides with humidity. So it's nearly five months already where certain parts of the country have these high temperatures. And, and in the coming 10 years, 20 years, these months are going to be unlivable. That's the prediction. Um, if you look at the climate change policy and uh, climate change environment is a after the 18th Amendment, it's a devolved subject. So there's the national climate change policy, but there's also a recently approved synth climate change policy. And uh, the national climate change policy targets uh, areas where Pakistan's international commitments are involved. This is where our NPCs are. For example, if we've committed to shift our vehicle population to electric vehicles by 30% by 2030, the climate change policy sort of has agenda items that lead to those uh, objectives. And uh, similarly, you have a forestation project. So we commit to 10 billion trees and climate change policy will have action items which will lead to that objective. To be very honest, uh, when it comes to infrastructure, we aren't prepared at all. Our infrastructure, especially the highways that you've mentioned, if you look at the Indus Highway, if you look at the National Highway, uh, most of these are currently have been damaged over the years and they're also nearly at the end of their lifespan as well. Uh, similar to, uh, if, if you look into Gilgit as well, the landsliding has, in most cases, it is linked to your uh, precipitation and rain systems as well, but naturally the, the area is somewhat prone to landsliding. And since we have uh, increasing construction activity, particularly since the dams have started being built, the Pasha Dam, and then you have the Dasu Dam, this also creates a little instability in the mountains. Similarly, we had road construction activity. So there are different reasons for it. But coming towards the southern side of the country, I think uh, infrastructure-wise, we have to really start thinking what can be done. Because uh, sort of damages that we're seeing is happening to infrastructure that was already at risk. So for a while, we knew that this is at risk. For the past two, three years, and because there was not enough rainfall, there was not enough uh, water in the rivers, uh, people start worrying less about these things. The thing that maybe if two years there's no rain, maybe there's, no, there's not going to be enough rainfall in the next year as well. But the fact of the matter is that we cannot really predict what will happen and uh, what will be the intensity of it. So these question marks are not usually left to the state of things that, as they are. These question marks are usually resolved by building enough resilient infrastructure well in advance so you can tackle it if it comes to that point. At this point, it only makes sense that Pakistan demands more uh, climate justice at the international forums. It needs to start lobbying for the resources it deserves because the developed world, which is responsible for the emissions, has to provide the resources. It's a simple uh, consequence of their actions coming to, to coming to our homes. So 
in a way pakistan needs to demand those resources and then those resources have to be spent in these in this sort of infrastructure resilience uh, developing local capacity having local solutions and you sort of leading to into that direction uh what we can do i think in the long term is that we seriously need to think that our models of own like internal models of development are they going to be sustainable if the rains uh, continue on as this much or the heat waves continue uh, to come back so for example uh, the rains in karachi are unexpected but the rains in other parts of the country like islamabad uh, peshawar lahore these areas they're not unexpected there and they haven't really really gone above or beyond what existing records say so we know that there will be variations throughout the uh, country and uh, within a single region you will have very very different sorts of expectations as well so the southern part of country is suffering the central is sort of still stable the northern has excessive melting because due to heat so each area will require a different sort of intervention and uh, in a long term policy we had to set goals on those sort of interventions uh, is heat wave going to be a big thing for karachi it will probably be prediction say it's going to be what is in jakbabad right now might happen to cities like hyderabad um, similar high temperatures but because hyderabad has such a large population it will have a much bigger impact as well in karachi your humidity and heat levels are going to go up similar in similar in lahore there's these are millions of people who will be at the mercy of heat waves or torrential rains the average global warming till, uh, till right now is 1.2 degrees celsius but there are cities in pakistan which uh, are reportedly uh, touching nearly 2.5 degrees celsius uh, from the pre industrial temperature records so that's where we stand right now our emissions aren't that high but because of uh, climate patterns because of geography uh, we are more uh, prone to uh, heat building heat surplus in certain regions similarly in the mountainous north because the exposure to your regular heat is very variable so the himalayas for example are experiencing higher temperatures than southern parts of the country if you're talking about cleaner fuels and cleaner energy renewables for example putting pakistan get put those up and pakistan can start meeting a lot of its needs from renewables but there are chances that our you know, the impacts of global warming will still be same because we depend on a larger global community to control global warming uh, similarly if we are talking about adaptation and uh, this is sim- given you an example of your uh, heat prone regions uh while we can adapt to certain changes for example we can begin your uh, your food cycles can be uh, made more resilient i i don't necessarily think that that is going to be enough so for example your agricultural is going to be dependent on water resources and water resources as we saw during the heat wave of this uh, year are very very variable and again you had examples that the heat became so extreme that your uh certain food crops uh did not really yield as much and close to if we talk about at the start of this month you had the date crop in uh, certain parts of sindh which was ready to be uh, basically dried up but because of torrential rains even the date crops were uh, really really badly damaged so you so you have examples where your pakistan alone cannot be doing enough and to say that we can protect ourselves the max we can do is if you're talking about energy systems we can have enough energy in the system that we can provide cooling to people uh we can provide uh, key infrastructure uh, like public hospitals and universities these areas can be maintained in terms of emergency use so that's the sort of thing that we can do for protection the point that a lot of these discussions that we try to make is that uh, whenever we say that pakistan is in contribute enough it obviously does not mean that the government in pakistan does not owe it to its people to act uh, of course it's its responsibility it's a, even a fundamental right if you look at every person's constitutional rights 
so in a way it is the government's duty and the, while people like me who are not in the ministry or in, who are not policy maker or policy implementer while we can say pakistan is pakistan is not emitting enough so we are not responsible as individuals the government of pakistan cannot say the same to the people of pakistan it has to be answerable at what cost or what sort of budgeting it is doing for mitigation and adaptation why is the climate change ministry's budget so low why are the provincial governments in each of the different provinces in the country why are their environmental budget so low and if within those resources they have where have those resources been effectively uh, spent and because probably environment at this point is still not seriously taken that is where i think we need to emphasize that there should be a difference between state and people the state still has a responsibility it is dependent on the state how it raises its resources uh, a lot of us pay taxes so we have expectation that investments go into health education but also need to start flowing into environment because if you don't have a stable a uh, running system if you have floods if your city is damaged if your school buildings are damaged if your hospitals are damaged because of disasters how will any of the objectives of government in terms of education in terms of infrastructure or health can be met so we need to be start we, at the really when we communicate climate change we need to start differentiating that if a minister or if a states person is coming to you as a individual and saying that oh we pakistan as a country does not emit but pakistan as a country is 220 million people while ministries and decision makers are very few in this country so they are still responsible as to how or why they have not been able to do enough and what will it take for them to act more seriously